Welcome to the podcast of data and analytics in business. We will learn from the leading industry experts using data and analytics to solve the problems and create values in practice. We will also learn where the industry is heading to and how data and analytics will shape the industry in the future. Most importantly, how they are preparing their business for digital transformation and disruption in the future. I am your host, Jason Tan, and thank you for listening. In this episode, we have got Chris Dorman. Chris is the executive manager of data and algorithm ethics at Insurance Australia Group, or IAG. IAG is one of the largest GI company in Australia and New Zealand. With an academic background in mathematics, it is not a surprise that those skill set has helped Chris to have a strong problem solving skill set. With that being said, Chris share with me and how the younger generation of the analytic professional could develop their career in the field of data and analytic and also the field of ethical artificial intelligence or ethical AI. Chris and I spoke in details on his paper discussing IAG Australian AI ethics framework and how they incorporating this ethics framework into the projects and AI system that they develop at IAG. Equally, we also go on in details to discuss about the the size of the data set and how it could potentially and why it would not necessarily impacting the AI from the ethical perspective and what is important when it comes to design the system to ensure the ethical AI are incorporated into the system design and development. Specifically, we use many case study and also um, example in the insurance industry, such as the pricing, pricing analytics, use of AI in the claim cases, and overall, how one should think about the ethical AI from the social impact as well as the customer impact. Finally, we conclude the podcast interview with some of the framework and conceptual tools that Chris and his colleague developed at IAG, which you can find in the link in this podcast. Equally, how other industry can learn from the insurance industry in the use of data-driven system and the incorporation of ethical AI when it comes to the balance of driving the business growth versus the impact of the society. Now, if you are a senior business leader in the organization who have been long wanting to implement AI in your organization, but you are equally concerned about the bias and the ethic that comes with the AI, I would highly, highly recommend listening to this episode about the the thoughts and the perspective that Chris is sharing with us in this subject. And not to forget, make sure you, you read his paper in this very subject of the ethical AI and how your engineers and how your senior manager can make the right decision when designing and developing your business IT system. If you have questions for Chris or myself, make sure you connect to Chris on LinkedIn and send him a message or maybe send me a message. If you enjoy the different aspects about the use of data and analytics, such as one episode like this, make sure you click the subscribe button and use your action to drive the platform in sharing the podcast to more people. I am your host, Jason Ten, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Chris, welcome to the Analytics Show podcast. I'm so excited to have you here to talk about AI ethics and uh, all the insurance things about today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. The pleasure is mine. Now, I want to start this a little bit like and go into your background a little bit. I am hopeful that this sort of like 
a background explanation helps the younger people and the younger generation to figure out, you know, what they want to do with, with their career, right? So I know you have got a background in maths and gradually move into the insurance pricing analytic and then data science and AI. My question for you is, before AI and data science become really a thing, <laughs> have you always thought about that? Or, or will you say this is more of a natural outcome because of your experience in maths and modeling, or you have to consciously choose your path to and pivot accordingly? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's good that you ask these things, right? Because it's important for people early in their career to sort of hear from people like myself who've been in the industry and done things for a while and, and how things have progressed. I, I think for me, it's been very organic, right? There's been no real sort of master plan for like 10 years or something that I don't think those are real, right? Even when, even when it's, to be honest, I think the world changes so much over five or 10 years that if you have this view that I'm going to do my boss's 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 job in 10 years, time well well that job's not going to exist in 10 years time probably so so I've, I've generally just sort of moved pretty organically through my career as you said I sort of started out doing I did maths at uni did a master's degree and thought about staying in academia and then moved into actuarial consulting role first which I did for quite a few years back in the UK and that was I guess the first major decision right to sort of come out of academia and go into industry. And generally, my decisions are always based on what I find interesting at the time. But that one wasn't. That one was uh, sort of mainly economic, right? So more money to be made, not in academia. <laughs> so that was my motivation there. But since then, it's been mainly just whatever I've been interested in based on either things like opportunities that come up or things I've been exposed to. So in actuarial consulting, that's sort of to the insurance industry. Typically, the firm I was with was just purely advising general insurers. So I learned quite a lot about the industry early in my career, and, and I've never left it. It's sort of um, one of those industries that a lot of people don't intend to end up in sort of deliberately, but once you're in it, you never escape. And that's a good thing, right? Because it's a very industry and we, and we do a lot of good work, right? We're there to uh, help people when they fall on hard times and when bad things happen. And so there's a lot of good things that are, that are done by the industry. And so people tend to stick in it. And from a technical perspective, there's always interesting things going on. There's lots of data. It's been data driven for a long, long time. And so people like myself with a technical background can, uh, can get a lot out of it. And it's always evolving, right? Risks are always evolving. And so there's always something new happening. As we've seen in the last year or so, there's been pandemics and things like that. And the industry's had to sort of adapt to, to that. So there's always something happening. And especially in a country like Australia, I mean, obviously I've moved from the UK, I've been here you know, 11 years or so now. It's a very different country to England, right? There's natural disaster happening. It's a huge country. So there's always something happening somewhere or other. It's very different to genteel England. At least we have a better weather, I would say. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But from an insurance industry perspective, it's way more interesting as well because just more stuff happens. There's, uh, there's a lot going on day to day in terms of natural disasters and things like that and just the diversity of the country, right? There's uh, all sorts of different environments and, and things happening. So fascinating place to work. I'm curious to know, given the, your academic background in maths, how important do you think maths is your foundation to do what you do in actual consulting? I know how important it is in the actual consulting because I know with those people a lot, but equally perhaps more of the in the world of the data science and AI because I sort of like feel that a lot of time in the newer generation, especially of the data scientists, is more trained on the software. And equally, I think software is important, but equally... I also think that math is so important as well. But I'm curious to know how, how well you think it play out for you of doing what you do now with your maths as a foundation. Well, I, maths as a degree teaches you a lot about problem solving and logic, right? It, it's not necessarily that I'm going to sit there solving equations. In fact, I've probably not done it for so long. I probably can't anymore, right? So I'm definitely not going to be doing that day to day. But it teaches you a way of thinking about problems, which I think is very generally applicable to all sorts of uh, settings. And 
if you're trying to solve real world business problems, I think a sort of methodical, logical approach is useful. And so definitely in the, well, in any setting, it's probably helpful, but certainly in the sort of data science area, it's, uh, it's I think it's been very useful to have that way of thinking. It's a bit different if you're sort of a software engineer. That's that's an engineering practice, right? So you're sort of trying to sort of build things more. Now share with us a bit more about your organization that you work for, IAG, and also your role as a executive manager for data and algorithm ethics at IAG. Yeah, so IAG is, uh, I mean, not a lot of your listeners are necessarily from Australia, I imagine. So we're, we're an Australian and New Zealand-based general insurance company. We're the biggest general insurance company in those markets. And we write about $12 billion Aussie of premium per year. So it's so pretty large. And we have a lot of the leading brands in these markets. So if you live in this country, you might have heard of like NRMA, CTU, things like that. Um, in New Zealand, it's AMI, State, NZI, those sorts of brands. So pretty leading brands in what they do. It's general insurance. So that means, I mean, around the world, that might get called property and casualty or non-life, depending on what country you're in. But basically not life insurance, not health insurance, but pretty much everything else, right? So that's your car, your house, your boat, if you're lucky enough to have a boat, your light aircraft, if you're, you know, fly light aircraft, which some people do, or your business or your liability for your injured workers or things like that. So anything else that could be insured that's not life and not health is something that we're interested in as a, as a general insurer. And so it's very diverse, which I find pretty interesting. There's always sort of different things to think about, depending on the product you're looking at and the risks you're looking at. So, so that's pretty good. We say our purpose is to make your world a safer place. And that obviously includes using AI and data and automation and the like responsibly, because if you're not doing that, then you're not being safe with them. So my role got created about two or three years ago after a bit of a discussion we had amongst the sort of analytics team and others about governance and ethics and that sort of topic. There's really two prongs to it. There's like an internal aspect and an external aspect. So internally, I basically develop frameworks and give advice to people who are developing AI systems or automation projects or what have you, so that they can make sure that they're doing those things in an ethical and responsible way. So there's some tools that we've got and some frameworks that we uh, try and get people uh, involved with so that then they can make sure that they're sort of de-risking their projects from those perspectives. Externally, then I get involved in a range of sort of research and advocacy type activity. We sort of acknowledge that if we're going to really live our purpose and try and make your world a safer place, we can't just do that internally to the organization. We need to be advocating for responsible use of technology outside as well. And so we've done a few things in this area. There's obviously my role and I do a bit of speaking and research and things like that. We also sponsored a not-for-profit research organization, Gradient Institute, which I do a bit of work with as well. So that's based in Sydney. They do awesome work and training for people if they're interested in that. So yeah, lots going on and uh, pretty busy from day to day, but uh, exciting stuff. So I enjoy it. Now, speaking of these frameworks that you just spoke about, I want to congratulate you about the recent All Actuaries Summit Melville Prize for your paper discussing about this IAG in terms of view of the Australian AI ethics framework project. Tell us a bit more about this project and the importance of incorporating the Australian AI ethics framework into the project in a general sense. I mean, apart from, you know, uh, creating a set of plays, but why people should be paying attention to the AI ethics then? Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, we won that award. We were delighted and a bit surprised to pick that up. I mean, we'd... Um We'd been part of this government pilot of their AI ethics framework, and the government published this framework in, I think it was late 2019, I think it was the November when that came out, and they invited industry to participate in a pilot because they recognised these were sort of fairly high-level principles, it was a voluntary thing that you could adopt if you wanted, and so they encouraged industry to come and participate in a in a pilot implementation of that to essentially 
let them know how it went and work out what guidance they could give to others who wanted to adopt these principles. And we've been thinking about ethical AI for a while, right? And we had our own sort of internal framework, which we'd been using for a little while, which I'd built and tested on a couple of other projects. And so it was a good opportunity, we felt, to get involved with this government pilot and really test what we were doing against another framework that had been put out there and also learn from what others were doing. So there were, I think, six other pilot organisations from memory, maybe six in total. And so we had a few roundtable discussions with those organisations and with the government department about how the pilot was going, what we were all doing, what we could learn from each other, et cetera. And that was all really useful. So at the end of that, we've all written case studies, the pilot participants, and they all got published um, a few weeks ago as part of a summit that the government organised. So they asked me to come and talk at that and a few others and it seemed to go pretty well. So, yeah, we've all published these case studies. And I thought, well, we're writing this case study anyway for the government pilot. It'd be great because there's a sort of limit to how much you can put in a case study on the department's website in terms of technical have you. So I thought it'd be great if we did a more detailed write-up for the Actuary Summit as well, give people a bit more of the sort of nuts and bolts as much as we could of, of what was going on with that project and a bit more depth on how they can build these things. So so we put that together almost as a bit of an afterthought, really. The sort of, we were doing this anyway, let's extend it a bit and do it at the Actuary Summit as well. And then the, they gave us this prize, which, uh, as I say, was a delight and a surprise. And I guess the lesson that we get from that is probably that these real-world case studies are really necessary, right? There's not that many of them out there where we're saying it's not synthetic data, it's not made up, it's a real-world situation with real data and real customers affected, and this is what we did, and this is how we applied the principles and practice. There's not that many case studies like that. And that's a shame because people really need practical guidance, that's got to go beyond hypotheticals. It's got to be real. So people obviously enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. And so we were very happy to accept the award. And we donated our cash prize to charity, <laughs> for the record, <laughs> which uh, I always think is a nice thing to do. You're not doing these things for money. so. But yeah, it was very nice of them to give us that. And hopefully the professional audience got something from it. The project itself that we used for the case study was looking at car total losses. So this is a sort of claims case study. And AI is being used more by insurance companies in the claims journey than perhaps traditional where, you know, data-driven processes weren't that common. We felt it was a good one to try and try and talk about. So this looks at the car insurance total loss or write-off process, as people might know it. So after you've crashed your car, it'll go and get assessed by a, a motor repairer or one of our assessors, and we'll work out if it's able to be repaired for the amount that it's insured for, or if not, it'll be written off and you'll get paid you know, the sum insured less deductions. And that process can take a little bit of time, right, between you having the accident, lodging the claim to it getting assessed and getting declared a total loss. That can happen. That can take a little while. And so... In the middle of that, there's this uncertainty that customers face, right? Is my car going to be written off or not? And if it is, I'm going to need to go and buy a new car, and that's maybe a bit stressful. And so some early information would be helpful, right? So some likelihood of knowing if this is going to happen. And so we thought it would be a good idea to try and build a predictive model so that right after lodgement, someone's told us about this claim, the accident that's happened, we could tell them with a degree of certainty whether their car is going to be written off or not, even before it's been assessed, just based on the information we've got right at lodgement. And so we tried to build a model to do that, and it worked pretty well. But obviously, it's not perfect, right? There's going to be errors. And so we were quite worried about the impact of errors and what impact that might have on customers, particularly false positives, right? So the way model is we we would send a notification to customers if it looked reasonably likely to be a total loss we'd send a sms or an email depending on what how the customer wanted to be communicated with saying words to the effect of it looks pretty likely your car is going to be a total loss we're not sure yet we're still going to assess it but if it is a total loss this is what's going to happen and so on and so forth so people had some early warning but there's obviously the risk that someone gets that message and then their car isn't a total loss and it gets repaired and people get confused and, and it can be a bit of a problem potentially. So we did a lot of testing on like the messaging to make sure it wasn't misunderstood and people knew that it was just an early warning, not a final decision and things like that. 
And we made sure that we were measuring things as they got implemented at a small scale to make sure that no problems were occurring. And well, no problems seem to have occurred. So that was good. But we talked about that in our paper in quite some depth, just to show people the processes you can go through to to take care, right? Although nothing bad happened in this situation, the process we went through to try and make sure that nothing bad happened, we think is something that people can learn from. So yeah, that's what we did. And the results have been pretty good. I mean, when we presented this back in May, we were up to about 7,000 messages that have gone out, about 90% accuracy. So 90% of the time, these cars are total losses. So people are getting useful information. And our NPS scores as measured in a randomized control trial went up quite a bit and no major complaints. So it's it's been pretty good in terms of results. But we've obviously gone through a pretty thorough process to make sure that it's been done in a responsible way. Speaking of that thorough process, in your paper, you did highlight that the challenges or the complexity and equally the amount and the effort that sometimes that are really required is actually the end-to-end design and also the integration of the system as well as that even to the extent of like for example coming out all of those wording that are to be used in the SMS to make sure that it doesn't mislead people. As opposed to that, the model development it is only taking up a small percentage of the time. Yeah, model building is a tiny bit of analytics, right? It's exactly the fun bit that everyone enjoys, but it's it's the tiny bit, right? Actually getting into market, working properly, affecting people in the way you intend and not having horrible side effects. That takes a long time and it's difficult. And especially customer testing, it's important to do this really thoroughly if you're in a high stakes, high impact area like claims where you're dealing with people who've just been in a car accident, they're by definition going to be maybe vulnerable, maybe injured. So you've got to be really careful with how you're dealing with people here. You're not, you know, you're not selling them vegetables at a market stall. You're doing something really significant. So you've got to take a look there. So we go through this customer-led design process where, where we test potential messages with like actual customers, like real people, not insurance people, like actual customers that have signed up to, you know, to run and give us feedback on things we might be doing and stuff like that. Once we've got something we're reasonably confident in, we run things at a small scale, right? So you make sure at a small scale that nothing's going horribly wrong because if you just launch at a big scale and it's gone wrong, then it's gone wrong for everyone really quickly. It's the same way you do medical trials, right? You do a phase one trial where you give the new drug to 20 people and you see if has anyone died. (laughs) Well, no one died. Maybe I'll give it to a few more people and see what happens, right? I mean, here we're not potentially killing people. But you've still got to be careful, and that sort of small scale and slowly increase is a is a good process to follow, we think. So that's what we try and do. For the C-level who are listening to this episode, apart from the increased MPS score, how would you say it is impacting the business positively then? There's definitely been a, a saving in terms of effort, right? So what we found was... If you've got a car that's in this process of being assessed, you'd be calling the call center potentially to find out what's going on. And so people getting this sort of early warning message, sort of it deals with some of those calls preemptively. So that's obviously a cost saving for the business, which is, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, I mean, we didn't really do it with that intent, but we sort of acknowledged that that might happen and it seems to have done. So the call volumes have dropped a little bit for those sorts of reasons. The other thing it's shown our business is just what's possible, right? So we've talked about this particular project quite a bit over the last six months or so in various forums. And it's really given our business a bit of an incentive to try a few more things because we've shown that we can actually do something quite material to have a good impact, then it's been seen positively. So that's um, a good case study of what we can do. Coming back to your role as a EM for data and algorithm ethics here, I want to talk about how much of these area in terms of the discipline, such as data science, ethical philosophy, and logic, even maths, is really playing a role to be able to do the works 
and making sure that creating that framework and making sure that all these automated systems that you guys are creating are falling within the right framework and being ethical. Yeah, so as you say, there's a few disciplines that maybe I sort of draw from, and they're all sort of important in their own different way, right? So I think the main thing that's important in my role is that I can effectively communicate with a range of different people who all have different motivations and skill sets, right? So it's important that I have enough of an analytics skill set and knowledge that I can actually talk to the data science team about what they're doing and understand what a rock curve is and whatever. That's, you know, that's critical to be able to have those sorts of conversations with people. Otherwise, you have no credibility. Similarly, you've got to have enough business knowledge generally and ideally in the domain that you're working in to talk to the business stakeholders about what the project's trying to do, what could go wrong, what the implications might be, et cetera. So, it's important to have that domain knowledge and, and also just general business now about what the objectives might be and, and what the trade-offs might have to be. So again, if you don't have that, you can't have credibility in those conversations. So I have to draw on all of those sorts of skills. I certainly, you mentioned philosophy. I won't claim to be a philosopher. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've read a bit in the last few years, but I'm a rank amateur by any reasonable estimation. But the, the main thing that I think uh, I probably draw on is, is a bit of risk management sort of knowledge, some from my aerial days and some that you just sort of pick up as you, as you go in your career in these sorts of roles. Because a lot of what I'm trying to build is sort of frameworks to effectively manage risk of a certain type. So, yeah, I definitely use a bit of that. But the main skills are really soft skills. So it's communication and influence and things like that, particularly for the external stuff I've been doing. You've got to have a bit of tenacity because these things can take some time. You're not necessarily going to have the influence that you would like on day one. You've got to sort of keep it. So you definitely need to have a bit of that. So. Yeah, it's, it's all the soft skills that are most important, I think. Like technical is kind of table stakes, but it doesn't get you to the end. In that case, for anyone who wants to get into the field of the ethical AI, which is rather new, it looks like there is no clear pathway for them to really move into that. Then. Is that your from experience? My view on this is that if you're an analytics professional you have to be in the field of ethical AI, right? Otherwise, you're in the field of unethical AI. So, so you should feel obligated to like teach yourself or learn about this topic. You're building models and systems that affect people and you haven't thought about how those people might be affected, particularly if they're affected negatively, and you haven't thought about ethics of your system and you haven't thought about risk management, then you're in dangerous territory. And so I think all analytics professionals who are potentially having an impact on people need to worry about this stuff and, and be quite careful about it. Fortunately, there's a lot of stuff out there now that you can use to upskill. I mean, look, you can listen to people like me and various others who talk about this topic all the time. You can go to my friends at Gradient Institute and get trained if you want. If you're in Sydney, they'll happily do that for you for a small fee, I'm sure. You can do all sorts of things. There's lots you can read. High-level principles frameworks published by like loads of countries. We talked about the Australian one. A lot of other countries have published their own. The OECD's published some stuff. Various professional bodies have published things. I wrote something for the Institute of Actuaries locally here last year. We did an information note, which is like informal guidance on what to do, so people can have a look at that. Tons of stuff out there. What you then have to do, though, is, is the hard step, which is take those frameworks and try and think about what it might mean for you in your business. And that can be quite hard for people sometimes because there's no sort of rule book on how to apply these things. Although the Institute of Actuaries framework we did last year does give you some concrete things to do rather than just principles, which we thought was probably quite helpful for people. Another thing you can do is read some of the popular science books on this topic that have been published, especially in the last five years. There's been loads. You've got to be a little bit careful because if you go and read sort of AI popular science, half of it will be on sort of AGI type stuff. So it's interesting stuff, but I don't know how readily applicable that will be in your day-to-day -day work to go and read 
Bostrom super intelligence or anything like that, but it's interesting stuff. There's a whole bunch of books that are quite practical, right? That are talking about real world case studies of things that have gone wrong and you can learn a lot from those, right? So when I first started getting into this space, Everyone was uh, was reading Weapons of Math Destruction. That was kind of <laughs> book to read, right? Because everyone had read it, and there was tons of useful case studies in that for people to use as inspiration for what not to do. There's been a few others that I've read since. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples, right? So, this uh, automating inequality was quite good. That was very US based, so but it still talks about some problems that can occur around inequality and, and what have you in the US context. And there's like three three or four examples in that book from memory. If you want to look more broadly at misuse of data, I always like to recommend The Tyranny of Metrics to People, which is a brilliant little book, which basically teaches you about the side effects of uh, certain metrics and measuring things, which I think is very uh, important for analytics people to sort of bear in mind. So there's tons of stuff out there, right? There's formal training high-level frameworks, there's case studies now, there's people like me giving talks and others, there's popular science books. So there's no excuses, I don't think, for analytics professionals to think that they don't know how to get into this area. But as I say, what you have to do then is apply it to your own situation. And so you really have to ask, what could go wrong with my system due to sort of design decisions that I've made? Like who can get worst affected because of design decisions I've made and like, why is that okay, right? How could severe harms occur because of how my system's designed and is that okay? What problems might I be inadvertently causing, right? And some of these books can really help your imagination on on that front. Are there conflicts in the goals to be managed? Because your business stakeholders might have five or six different goals. They might conflict with each other. Different customer groups might have different needs. And so you've got to be, there's always conflicts to manage. You've got to worry about that. With all that in the melting pot, you've then got to say, well, what actions am I going to take in my system design to to manage all that? And if you're an analytics professional and you're not doing that stuff, you're in dangerous territory. (laughs) Now, speaking about applying that into the industry and given your decade experience in the GI or general insurance, What do you think are the main challenges for the insurance industry as a whole that is facing regarding about the ethical use of AI and ML models? I I think the insurance companies or industry is not new about using the data and analytics, but I think with the rise of the concern about the AI and ML model, which is more powerful than ever, how do you think we should address them then? Yeah, well, I mean, insurance has done data-driven stuff for a long time, right? Pricing's been data-driven for hundreds of years and and underwriting aim and certain bits of sales, right? So the conversation's quite mature. It doesn't mean that we've solved all the problems, though. There's certain topics that come up from time to time. And as you say, the Greater availability of more data combined with more powerful tools does mean that some of the traditional problems are maybe more severe than they have been in the past. Sort of more granularity of pricing, is that's a traditional problem, right? That's been around for a long, long time. But in the sort of big data AI sort of era, it definitely gets more severe. There's a really good Actuaries Institute paper from 2016, which talks about some of this stuff and sort of spells out some of the problems. I mean, essentially, if you've got more granular pricing, that means some prices are going up and some prices are going down. Well, the ones that are going up are going to become less affordable. That's by definition what's going to happen because they're going up. It might be fair, but it's still a problem even if it's reflective of risk because the prices are going up and maybe that causes issues. And that's been talked about a lot over the years, right? The main challenge that the industry as a whole is going to face, I think, is that more data is coming. That's happening, right, already. And so more granularity is going to be available. The traditional view of the industry has been if data is available and it predicts risk, then we should use it for pricing, right? That's just how the industry has grown up for hundreds of years. But there's probably going to come a point where you're going to have too much data and it becomes socially unacceptable to, to keep going down the granularity route. And so the industry is going to have to work out how to manage that change. And the traditional idea of 
all data, if it's legally allowed to be used, being used for pricing, is probably going to have to be challenged. And I mean, I've written papers on this previously, which maybe we'll talk about in a bit. But yeah, I mean, the traditional insurance market, you got all your data from your consumers directly, pretty much, right? So you came along to your insurance company and they asked you 10 questions or 20 questions or whatever, and you answered them. And that was most of the data that they had. So that was a natural limit to how much you could collect, right? It's a limited by people's knowledge of the world because some questions they just can't answer, right? I can't tell you how high my flood is above the mean flood level of the local floodplain. Like, I don't know. No point asking me because I can't answer the question, right? But there's also a limit of tolerance, right? You can't ask me 500 questions because I'm just not going to bother. I'm going to buy my policy from someone else. But if data is available from elsewhere or if the consumer can just press a button and throw data at you, then that opens up situations which haven't really been contemplated. So we need to be a bit more careful, I think. There's certainly some attitudinal research, particularly out of the US recently, showing that uh, plenty of insurance consumers don't think that all data should be used for pricing. There's a lady called Barbara Kiviat who did some research into, it was mainly car insurance and uh, banking. I think it was loans from memory and basically asked American consumers, should this data be used to make those decisions and itemized, you know, a bunch of data and took people's views on the matter. And a lot of the time, the general public said no. So when these things come out, insurers and banks and others need to listen and act appropriately. Pricing aside, though, because that's a traditional area, as I said at the start, we've sort of got a lot of uh, thinking already done on that, although there's probably more still to be said. As I said earlier, there's, in, insurers are going to use data and AI and automation in areas that they haven't traditionally used it. So things like claims, where you've got to be really careful, right? As I said before, claims is um, an area where people are potentially quite vulnerable and not always in obvious ways, right? I mean, obviously, if your house has just burned down, you're going to be stressed, you're going to be vulnerable. But it's not always obvious that someone might be feeling that way. So sometimes even insignificant claims can leave people a bit shaken. So you've got to be pretty careful how you're, how you're dealing with people in that scenario. And automation might not always be the best approach. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots to be said. <laughs> <laughs> I want to draw on that data collection a little bit. Like you were saying earlier that traditionally, the amount of data collected by the insurance were based on the number of the questions that they asked, right? For example, they, ask, they probably asked 10 questions or the other company probably asked 15 questions. But I suppose over the time, especially over the last two decades, and I know for a fact because some of the works that I have done in this area is that the ability to collect the external data without even having to ask the customer is getting easier and also getting more accessible now. Now, from the engineering perspective, from the analytic perspective, I think it is a beautiful thing because I didn't have to ask two other questions just to get a full view of that. Instead, I could just buy the data. With the trend of rising the ability to collect external data, which in my view, equally also think that it just make the pricing or make the system, make the understanding of the customer more powerful. But to some extent, it will force the company, it will force the insurer to be really treading that fine line of the balance to say, well, we enjoy all these external data collection without having to ask the customer, but equally, we got to tread that really fine line because, the, like you say, the customer are not really particularly enjoying that. If I don't tell you, actually, I don't want you to, to know, how do you think the insurance can really walk this fine line in terms of the risk management and underwriting the risk then? I think you've got to challenge yourself at all times about what you're doing and really try and be very customer-centric when you're doing that so that the mindset shouldn't be, I'm always going to do the thing that makes me more money as an insurance company. It needs to be what's acceptable and, and the like. And, you know, as I've written about a bit about this in the past, but there's also a difference between different types of data, right? So data about the built environment is probably a lot 
a lot less problematic, right? So information about the house that I'm sitting in right now, a lot of that information I probably wouldn't know, but it's probably quite useful information for risk analysis, right? So how close is the nearest tree? Well, I can see it over there, but I haven't measured the actual distance, right? But I know that as an insurance person, that's important for like bushfire modeling. So I can sort of logically accept as a consumer that an insurance company will probably want to know how close the nearest tree is. And it's probably a reasonable thing that an insurer would rely on that to work out how risky my house is for bushfire risk or something like that. So the built environment is probably a bit less problematic. I think the real issues come down to where it's like personal information, particularly in regimes that don't have strong like privacy controls. So Australia has fairly strong privacy controls and certainly that's being reviewed, the Privacy Act, so that'll get even stronger, I would imagine. But other countries don't necessarily have as strong regimes and so it's um, definitely more problematic in, in some places than others. There's also the challenge of like who's going to gain against who's going to lose out. So if I say to a consumer, share this data and you might get a cheaper price, most people will press the button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that's just how people work, right? But if I say that's going to maybe make the price go up for a certain small cohort of the population, like that's a hard problem to solve at a societal level if you allow it in for a reduction. So it's going to be an interesting one to grapple with, I think. Now, another aspect of the ethical AI, one of the things that I often think about is the size of the data set. And I want to draw your view and get your thought on the size of the data set and the importance of of it to, to train the model. So what I mean by that is, suffice to say, if the larger the sample of the data, I mean, the better model it can be trained and developed. But equally, because of the competition dynamic and the market share, everyone or each of the insurer will attract and underwrite certain segment of the customer. With that being said, no one would actually really ever own the full population of the data. And that is really anywhere <laughs> is the case for any industry. The question right. then is... Yeah, that's not an insurance problem. That's a general problem. <laughs> exactly. So the question then is, How can we avoid becoming a perpetual problem while training the model to be more ethical and inclusive? And I think inclusive is probably the keyword here, given that ones would never have the full population of the data. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good question, right? So I think, and as I say, it's true in all competitive markets, right? That unless you're a monopoly, you don't have access to the full population data. Even if you had access to the full population data, right, that's still not sufficient necessarily, right? Because if you think about it, I mean, I'm going to use insurance examples, right? But it's probably in other industries as well. Like your your insurance claims are naturally limited anyway, right? So I don't have a thousand years of claims history for Chris Dolman or Jason, right? It, It doesn't exist. And so the models that are going to be built are creating inferences from the general population about individuals, but it's not true that necessarily the, the data is fully complete and you have sort of perfect knowledge about the world. You still have an inference problem. And so the things that you need to do to make sure that you're being, that you're acting appropriately are, are still the same, right? You need to make sure that if there's vulnerable or sensitive or protected groups in your population that you appropriately consider how they're being treated relative to one another or as individuals or what have you. There's lots of literature on how to do that now. Sometimes that's tricky because sometimes you don't have data about certain types of vulnerability or protected statuses or what have you. That's a sort of known problem that people are grappling with, but it's not solved yet. But there's definitely things you can do to try and make sure that um, that people are treated appropriately. And you're going to need to do those things anyway, even if you're a monopoly, because I don't have a 1,000 years of claims history for Chris Dolman. I also don't know what Chris Dolman's risk looks like if I move house next week because I've never lived in the house, right? And, or if, I, if I'm lucky enough to go and buy a Ferrari next week, I've never driven one. I don't know what the risk is of me driving a Ferrari. So there's still an inference problem and I still need to take care. It sounds like more of a design problem rather than a technical problem. From what you say, design problem is more of a philosophy problem in a way that how they decide to treat it. It's a design problem and you can 
solve that problem quite neatly by considering outputs carefully and making sure that the outputs are appropriate of whatever the thing is that you design. The mechanism in the middle is obviously important, but it's not as relevant as what the outputs actually are. In insurance, you don't always have a data-driven mechanism for certain things, right? There's certain risks that have like never occurred in recorded history, but they're still risks and they still need to be considered, right? So, you know, I'm not that far away from Sydney. Sydney earthquake is a very important risk to worry about for an insurance company like IAG. There's never been a big earthquake in Sydney in like modern recorded history to let us know how big a risk that might be from like historical data. So you're using inference and sort of models from geologists and you know, earthquake modelers and others to try and estimate what that might be. But it's art as well as science, right? So a fully complete 100% of the population data, it doesn't really solve all of the problems, unfortunately, even if it were to be true. Now, speaking of design, I'm curious to know, in your view, as the AI big data algorithm are increasingly more accessible. And also from the pricing perspective, the number of these rating factor using pricing is also increasing and more in variety and even intimacy than before. Suffice to say, I think it's possible for those who really master these can use the pricing to cherry pick a good risk and leave the bad risk for others. So what would you be advised for the company to walk the fine line in the ethical pricing versus the business interest for profit and growth? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, the traditional view in the industry of a lot of people and probably still is of some people is that if data is there and it predicts risk, then it should be used. And that's perfectly. And so I don't agree with that view, as has probably been clear from what I've said already. I think there are definitely reasons why you wouldn't want to be using all of the data. And there's there's heaps of reasons like that. And maybe we go into that in a minute. But um I think businesses need to challenge whether or not the data they're using is socially acceptable. And to do that, you need to get out of your own organization and go and talk to like real people, not insurance people, like actual real people, and make sure that you get their views on what you're doing. And you might find that the answers are different to the views of people internally in your company. And certainly some, uh, there's some research that's come out in the last couple of years from the US and the UK, and the answers are pretty clear, right? There's certain categories of data that the public think shouldn't be used for various types of insurance pricing. The challenge that insurers are going to have is if there's data that's being used already across a market, and so it's kind of embedded in a market as uh, common usage, but we decide it uh, shouldn't be used in future. And sort of enacting that change is quite challenging. So there's been the recent example in the US of credit scores. So credit scores have been uh, used in the US car insurance market for a long, long time. That it's not used here in Australia. And it's very controversial, right? A lot's been written on the topic. And so there was a, a startup came out quite recently, it was a couple of months ago, saying we're not going to use credit scores and you know we don't think it's right and we're going to make a big stand and not do it and made a lot of news, right? But it's it's quite hard to enact that change as an individual company. You've got to have a sort of movement of the whole industry to make it stick because, as you say, you get um, selection effects that are, that are a bit of a problem. So it's hard. You've got to enact change at industry level if it's an existing thing. If it's a new thing, then it's a bit easier. You can sort of collectively decide that that shouldn't be done. Now, on that note, do you have a framework or a conceptual tools that people would be able to use to reason about the questions surrounding this sort of pricing, risk pricing and system design then? Well, I I have a first go at that. I mean, so myself and some co-authors wrote a paper on this last year, which we presented to the Actuary Summit 2020, which people can find if they want on my LinkedIn and they'll find that from your uh, podcast, I'm sure. So what we said was we rejected that view that I've said that some people have, which is that all all data is fair game. We said, let's reject that. Let's think of the reasons why we might not use data and try and categorize that sensibly and think about the sort of underlying philosophical reasons why we might be rejecting these things. And we came up with sort of two categories of reason, which we thought were quite compelling. The first is sort of epistemic 
So reasons of knowledge, right? So if you're using data to set prices, you're doing that because it gives you some knowledge about risk. But not all types of risk should necessarily be priced in line with the estimate of risk, right? There's plenty of types of risk that shouldn't be priced in that way. And we've had recent debates in society about various examples, right? The last, um, about two or three years ago, this was being debated in Australia about genetics. So should your genetics and your predisposition to certain health conditions affect your life insurance price? That was a huge debate that went on for a little while. And in the end, there's been a moratorium on that. So it generally doesn't affect your life insurance price unless you do. There's various rules around it. It gets a bit complicated. I won't go into it. But basically, we had this conversation about a particular example, right, where there's data there, it predicts risk, but it shouldn't be used because you shouldn't be held responsible for that thing that's innate to you that you can't change, right? And so innate risks, if you get knowledge about innate risks, it doesn't mean you should use that knowledge, right? Because it's the wrong sort of knowledge to use. And there's other sort of similar categories, right? There's not necessarily things that are innate, but things that society wants at least some people to take as risks, right? So dangerous jobs is an example of that, right? So you as an individual can decide not to do a dangerous job, that's fine. That's managing your risk and you can make that choice if you want. But if we all make that choice and like there's no firefighters or anything like that, then we have a bit of a problem. So we perhaps shouldn't be penalising those individuals that take those risks that we as society want at least someone to take. And again, that's possibly the wrong sort of knowledge to be used. That premium for that risk needs to be collected somehow, right? So we need to have a discussion in society about how to raise that revenue to pay for the risks that eventuate still. And we sort of didn't tackle this in the paper, but risk pricing is perhaps not the way to do it. Um, so, so that's the epistemic category. Is, is it the right knowledge about the right sort of thing to be risk pricing? And the second category was sort of social reasons, right? So putting aside knowledge for a second, certain people just don't like certain types of data being used to set insurance prices. And you've got to respect that, right? So if it's considered to be too personal or too private or somehow intrusive or just makes people uncomfortable to know that you know all this stuff about them, well, that's important information, right? We need to respect that and take an appropriate stance as a result. Some types of data has unintended consequences if you use it. I mean, let's use genetics again as the example. And it, this was really happening, right? There were people who were not going and getting genetic tests because they were worried that their insurers were then going to change their prices if they got found that they were vulnerable to certain diseases. But that's a, that's a bad outcome, right? Not to do with insurance, but like we're just, People aren't getting knowledge about health risks that would be useful knowledge to have. So these sorts of side effects are, are a bit of a problem. And so that's another reason why genetic data shouldn't be used. Um, but we've got to worry about these sorts of side effects as, as they occur. And there's various other things. We listed about a dozen in the paper that we thought were sort of social reasons not to use data as well. So they're sort of separate categories. And so we said, well, it could be an epistemic reason. It could be the wrong sort of knowledge about risk. Or it could be just a social reason. People just don't like it for some reason or other, and there's heaps of reasons why. So those are both valid reasons not to use data. But then you've still got to think about the impact on the firm of not using that data. So as I said earlier, if there's general market practice to use something and you decide not to, there's potentially a, an effect of that, and that could be quite costly. So if that's the situation, then you've probably got to think to yourself to push for some industry reform if you really strongly believe it shouldn't be used. And that was, that was kind of how we concluded it. So it's version one of a framework. I don't think it's necessarily the final version, but hopefully it helps people conceptualize some of the thinking that could go into this. You can apply similar sorts of thinking to other industries, we think, as well. I was going to say that, but before that, I can't help but to draw a similarity and an analogy of what Apple came out and do in over the last six months, where they practically say privacy is important for the customer, and we decided to limit the tracking or at least make people well aware of exactly what sort of tracking and the data that the apps are, are collecting and this is what we're going to do. <laughs> so to some extent, I think it does draw a similar of what we have just... It is similar. So it's saying, look, there might 
business benefit to doing something, but it's not socially acceptable, so we're not going to do it. And and in the long run, that is of business benefit, right? So Apple will gain from that in the long run, and insurers will gain similarly if they take a strong stance on these things and, and lead the discussion, I think. So, yeah. I suppose my final question for you then is for other industry who are not who are not insurance and they probably have less a worry or concern about the societal the social impact about the way they use the data and algorithm and ai and analytics what would be your advice for them to say they should still include they should still have ethical ai they should still have algorithm ethic in terms of what they do and how it could impact their customer? So I think it depends on on what the impact on the customers could be, right? So I think there's plenty of situations where it's really benign what's happening, right? So it probably doesn't matter who sees banner ads on Google for certain brands if there's like no financial offer or something. It's just, hey, we're brand X. Like, you know, it probably doesn't matter too much. There might be some side effects of that. I haven't really thought about it. But there's there's certainly cases that are quite benign, like certain types of retail are probably like that as well, right? But if you're in a situation where there's the potential, then you do have to worry about this stuff. And, and so I think you need to assess your decision situation. So you forget about AI. What decision are you actually making that affects people? And if that could harm those people in some way, that could be a physical harm, it could be a financial harm, it could be an emotional harm, whatever, any sort of harm, then you need to take care. It's a material decision. And so some of these sectors are already fairly heavily regulated, like financial services certainly is, and various others are as well. But there's probably situations where regulation doesn't exist yet for certain types of high-stakes decisions. And so maybe this... uh, discussion that we're having as society about the use of AI will sort of inspire those regulations to spring up. The other thing is sort of system-wide effects. So I've talked a lot about the effect on individual customers and because that's honestly what we focus most on. But in some settings, there's sort of system-wide effects that are material to think about as well. Like social media is the obvious example where you could potentially influence elections or things like this. And so it's not necessarily that any one individual person is getting materially harmed by a particular piece of social media stuff that they saw. Maybe that could occur sometimes. But the societal-wide effects are potentially huge. And so we need to be careful about those sort of aggregate problems as well as individual ones. It's not something that I worry too much about in my work because it's mainly about sort of individual customer decisions. But in some settings, that's quite important. I think the challenge about those settings, say if we were to use social media as an example, is how it is so transnational that making it so challenging. So if we were to use that as an example, say, for example, social media is usually is a global tech company. And then having the, it's so hard for any jurisdiction or it's so hard for any one particular country to have a strong influence, especially they are not necessarily have a strong regulation in, in the traditional policy framework already. It's going to make it so much harder for them to regulate that. <laughs> Maybe. I think there's definitely, definitely regulation can be used and some regulation already exists, right? So there's plenty of stuff being done already on social media, particularly after GDP and some things in the US recently. But you do sometimes get the situations like we had here in Australia last year where like Facebook gets turned off for a whole bunch <laughs> of people because there's an argument going on. And so that, that's not ideal. So it, it's tough. But I do think there is scope for regulation to emerge on these things. But I don't think the world's quite worked out how to do it yet. I think so. Now, we are almost at the end of this podcast interview I think time price so fast. I really enjoyed that. Now, that brings me to my final two questions that I always ask every single of my guests. Number one is, what is your most important first principle? Yeah, well, these final two questions, I found the hardest of all the questions you said before. <laughs> that, is what, that is what I designed. So, so an important principle, I don't know if it's the first one, but it's an important one, is to always question the status quo, right? So, like, we've always done it this way. It's always 
a horrible phrase to hear in business, right? It's been called the most dangerous phrase in business. So you always challenging the status quo. And I think because there can be problems with the status quo that need solving, and life's just more fun that way. You're going to be doing new things and, and innovating if you're doing that. So just do it. Yeah, let's go with that. I love it. Now, what is one book that you have read and thought it would have been better for your younger self to have? Well, as you might have gathered, I don't think a lot about my younger self. So I, this was the hardest question you asked me. I'm going to go with Fooled by Randomness by uh, Nassim Taleb. One I like to recommend to people anyway, and I, there's a nice lesson at the end of it that I think a, a younger me or maybe a younger anyone could probably sort of gain from. Right, so I I read his later stuff around the GFC like everyone else did. Right, when sort of Black Swan came out, and then I went into the back catalogue a couple of years later. And I mean, look, it's, it's it's a really nice book that sort of illustrates the sort of problems that that can occur when there's randomness in data, and it sort of fools you into thinking that there's patterns that are there that are that are really not. So there's various examples and stuff in the book, and it's a useful set of things for sort of business leaders and others and anyone that looks at data or charts or anything, which is pretty much everyone, to sort of learn from, right? Because you can uh, easily get fooled by information that you see. But the most important lessons at the end, right, where he looks at this and he goes, well, I've written a book about this topic, so I clearly know something about it, but I'm still not immune to this problem, right? So it's <laughs> still fooled by randomness. I can't help it. And so the way he tries to solve this problem is not by sort of assuming he can solve it actively. It's by just removing himself from the risk, right? It's taking away all of these opportunities for randomness to fool him. And I think it's it's an excellent lesson, right? I think some people uh, will hear about biases that they might have and then try and actively fight them. And this sort of humility of saying, well, I have these biases and it's just the way I am. I can't fight it, but I'm going to try and counter it another way by removing the possibility of it causing a bad outcome. I think it's a, it's a wonderful lesson for people. So I quite like that. And I think a younger me might have learned something from it more than the older me did. But either way, it's a good thing for people to know. Nice one. I actually never came across that book before. I have read the best one for a couple of times. I actually really enjoy it. So I should probably check out this one for my randomness. Yeah, he's, he's really good writing. Yeah. Now, thank you so much again, Chris, for this podcast interview. I really enjoy about the whole ethical aspect of the data analytics, data science, AI, or even to the extent of the pricing analytics in the insurance world. So uh, I really thank you, appreciate for all this view and knowledge that you are sharing. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been great.